Thank you. Hey, guys. Thanks for coming out. Um, I just moved to Oakland, so now I'm Oakland-based very recently. So today uh, we'll be talking about making work for humans, not consumers. So my name is Ivan. Um, yeah, I'm an artist, director, creative director. And I've got a very small creative studio called Cash Studios. When your last name is Cash, it kind of just works out to run with it. Um, and we create multidisciplinary projects um, that aim to infiltrate culture, create deep emotional connections, and inspire a whole lot of engagement. Um, and I work a lot uh, as a consultant as well at ad agencies, and then also work direct with clients um, in the Bay. There's a lot of tech companies that I work with. <clears throat> um, though today I'll be showing mostly personal projects. So first, a little background. I grew up in Marlboro, New York, which is 75 miles north of New York City. Um, less than 4,000 people, very rural, very beautiful. Um, also the hometown of Snooki from the Jersey Shore, if anyone knows. So that's kind of the vibe. We've, it's beautiful, but we've got that vibe going on. And uh, I got bullied a lot growing up. Um, I was the only Jewish kid at my school. And then to make it worse, I didn't have uh, video games or TV. And so, yeah, at one point when South Park came out, like, I thought that was an actual place that people were talking about rather than a TV show. And, um, yeah, I was always seeking for, like, a thing to connect with people on. And then I found, uh, or I was also, I wanted to have a voice. I wanted to connect. That was hard to do. So here's an endearing photo of me. Um, then I found basketball. And that was something that I'm still really passionate about to this day. And it's also something through which I was able to connect with uh, my peers. So in college, um, there was a president of the Knicks named Isaiah Thomas. And for anyone familiar with the NBA, he was a really awful coach. Uh, sorry, president at the time. Uh, the Knicks had a losing record for his entire tenure. Then he fired the coach and appointed himself as the head coach. They still had a losing record. They never made the playoffs. And so any Knicks fan was like, get this guy out of the organization. I was in a screen printing class at the time, and uh, do you guys know the expression, don't hate the player, hate the game? A little bit, so it's an expression. And <laughs> I made a t-shirt that said, don't hate the player or the game, hate the coach. <laughs> and so I thought it was clever. I was 20 at the time. Um, probably wouldn't put the word hate and a person of color on a t-shirt anymore, so uh, I was young, I was naive, and it felt like... Uh, a, a cause I was really passionate about, which was supporting the Knicks. So um, I put this shirt online, and somehow a sports blog picked it up. And it was the first time I'd ever had work that was like featured in anything. And I got emails from people asking where they could get a copy of the shirt. Um, and so I decided to go to Madison Square Garden, where the Knicks play, and sell the shirts. So it's me and a friend. Hand printed them all. I think we were paying like $5 for the t-shirt, 20 bucks a pop. It's a big markup as a broke college student. And um, it was really cool to create something and then have the interaction of someone like taking it and putting it on. Um, I know Johnny Cupcakes talked about making t-shirts and you know this power of then people wearing them. And there's a really an emotional connection that happens there. Um, so that was really cool and fulfilling. Um, I also got to talk to people as the Knicks got worse and worse the movement to fire this coach got greater and greater. And so people were interested in anything having to do with that. So I felt like I finally was having this voice. I got to talk about what I thought about the Knicks. And I was selling more and more shirts every game. Then on the fourth game, I was arrested. Um, taken away in cuffs, put in a holding cell. Um, I called the newspapers as soon as I got out. And this was on the first page of the New York Daily News. Um, so I didn't go back to selling t-shirts, but I did make a website where I sold hundreds more shirts online. <laughs> um, I was also interviewed in ESPN Radio. This shirt was featured in Slam Magazine. And so it was a really kind of neat opportunity for me to see the power of an idea and how that can spread really far and wide, even without any like real resources at all. Um, and so that taught me that even a broke college student can create a viral project, and I really fundamentally believe that like anyone sitting in this room can create a project that lots of people talk about and engage with. Um, it might not be the first one that you do, but if you just keep on doing little projects, that's really possible. Um, a year later when I was interviewing at ad agencies, I got hired as an art director 
at Venables Bell and Partners. And the reason I got the job, the creative director told me, was because of this, uh, this project of getting arrested and whatnot. So really, getting arrested led to my first professional job. <laughs> Um, about a year later, uh, I left and was ready for a new opportunity, and Wyden Kennedy Amsterdam was kind of my dream gig at the time. And through a kind of a crazy, yeah, it was kind of a wild story of how I got there, but I ended up going to Amsterdam without any interview set up, ended up getting a job, and so moved to Amsterdam. And um, one of the first assignments was for Coca-Cola, who has the uh, most likes of any brand on Facebook. And it was to write status updates for Coke. And this was a project that none of the other uh, creatives were interested in tackling. And my partner and I were like, oh, cool, we get to write status updates for like a whole day? Like, we just wrote hundreds of them. And the first one they published was one that I had written. And it said, we're trying to get exactly 18,392 likes and 3,523 comments on this post. I had just made up those numbers. But to me, there was something kind of cool about just being really real and transparent because as a brand on Facebook, everyone wants the likes and comments. They were just kind of owning it. So what do you think happened? Yeah, we didn't get it. Uh, it but it went, it went well beyond. And so the Coke client the next day wrote back and said, oh my god, this is the most engaging Facebook post ever. <laughs> And so the agency was like, oh my god, that's crazy. And I, had, I was shocked and totally surprised. Um, but then I became the social media expert. And <laughs> when, when Heineken was launching their Facebook campaign, or their campaign through Facebook, I got called upstairs to consult on the wording of their Facebook post, which was like very bizarre. Um, so through that project, my partner and I realized that the people on Coke's Facebook page really wanted to participate, and so we created a self-initiated uh, idea and project that Coke signed off on, which was single-serving websites that you only got to by solving a riddle. So can anyone guess what this website would be? You can just shout it out. A sticky hand is close. A stretchy hand, right. Um, so this is what happened when you went to a stretchyhand.com. And that's all. There was no <laughs> ad. There was no sell. That, it was really just this interaction. Um, Sitelets did really well. They were viewed over 16 million times. There was an average dwell time of three and a half minutes. Um, typically, a site is lucky if it gets over a minute of uh, you know, someone spending time on it. And so it was really cool to uh, have put that out there. And to me, it really served as a North Star in the kind of work I wanted to make, which is stuff that people would willingly choose to spend time with rather than be forced to spend time with. Does that make sense? Cool. Um, so, and that also taught me to take lots of small bets. Um, this was not a big budget project, and the reason it was able to get through and sold through so easily is because there weren't a lot of layers and a lot of people involved. And so I'm a big believer in trying, when possible, to have that nimble assignment to sneak in really cool shit. Um, so the last project at Wyden Kennedy that I'll share with you is the one that broke the camel's back. Um, and this was for Levi's. And the brief was to create this uh, really bespoke newspaper in Berlin. And because Berlin has a really strong creative community. We were empowered to get super weird, and we got to partner with this illustrative collective called Club Seven, Club Sieben, out of Berlin. And yeah, we, it, was, it was really fun. Um, it was a lot of work, but the design was really experimental and weird. And it was just cool to work on a commercial project that was being pushed in such a far direction. Um, and so, yeah, we were working pretty gnarly hours um, for two months to get this going. Um, that's like me at 1 a.m. on a weekend, and we're just like cranking, cranking, getting it all together. And then the day before the newspaper launched, we were really excited. We come into work the next day to find out that Whiting Kennedy's Portland office had taken the assignment to themselves, rewrote it, and redesigned it. And so this is what it looked like after, including a full spread page of ads. 
Um, and so we were like totally devastated. It was like two months of work, and like there was no transparency. It was just very like we came in and we we're like, oh, everything we've been working on is dead. And now there's like this very traditional looking newspaper that, you know, if that was the brief originally, fine, but it just felt like kind of a cop out from what we were trying to achieve. Um, and it felt like they didn't care about the audience. So, the, you know, the talk is about making work for humans, not consumers. In marketing or advertising, or even, uh, you know, if you work on client side, the word consumer comes up a lot, right? Um, I just looked it up, and the definition is a person who purchases goods and services for personal use, a person or thing that eats or uses something. So I find this a little bit antagonizing, and to me it reduces people to nothing more than buying machines. Um, I think we deserve better, and I invite you guys to stop using the word consumer and consider audience or people. Um, to me, person is a much more uh, palatable way of describing someone than consumer. Um, so I quit my job after five months at Amsterdam. Um, to this day, it's the scariest decision I had to make as an adult. Uh, I had to break the contract, pay back thousands of dollars, and go back home and face total uncertainty, kind of feeling like a failure. Um, I'd just gotten done with a kind of like messy breakup with someone, uh, so I was like, you know, no relational stability, no location stability, no job stability. And um, just knew I wanted to make a project that had some sort of human connection. So how many people here have sent or received a handwritten letter in the last week by a show of hands? I see like three. How about in the last month? Keep your hands up. A couple more. So you in the blue, who were you sending or receiving a letter to? Cool. And how how do you think your why did you send why did you choose to write a letter to your grandma? Yeah. Um, and how do you think she felt when she received it? Yeah. Cool. There you go. <laughs> With her iPhone, <laughs> um, sending or receiving a handwritten letter feels so good. Oh my God. Uh, I wanted to take the experience of uh, sending and receiving emails and transform it into receiving a letter. So I created a website called Snail Mail My Email and invited anyone in the world to send me a letter submission with a, recipient, like a, no, with a note and a recipient's address, and I'd then handwrite it and send it out to the person of their choosing, uh, free of charge. I invited people to also include like a doodle request or a, a lipstick kiss or a flower petal or a spray of perfume to play up the tangible nature of letter writing. Um, and I sent it to some family and friends, and it was cool to sort of be this, like, almost voyeur transcribing people's letters from one person to another. And that happened for a couple of days, and on the fourth day, Gizmodo picked up the project. And um, from there, a, a number of other press outlets picked it up. And so what do you think happened? So I got a 1,000 requests on the fourth day uh, without the, like, time, money, anything to, like, write that many letters, and had to take the project down for a day. But within that time, uh, this really beautiful thing happened where volunteer, like people reached out from around the world offering their services as letter writers. And that seemed like the only way of moving forward. And so um, it was all these people I hadn't met, a lot of college students, but also some middle American moms. Um, and people all over the world became letter artists and helped send out these letters to strangers. So I'll show a couple of those now. Andy, while you're hard at work, I am at home making blueberry pancakes while naked. <laughs> <clears throat> and so the person writing this doesn't know the letter requester and also doesn't know the recipient, right? They're just kind of serving as the middle person. Um, wherever you go, go with all your heart. And so this is someone that hand-stitched a letter. Um, letters got sent out all around the world and therefore were in different languages. This is Czech, French, and Portuguese. And so sometimes the person writing the letter wouldn't actually know the language that they were writing in. And so there was a, a huge variety of letters. This was a 30-day project originally. Um, it's since become a week-long project held once every year. And as to date, we've had over 1,500 volunteers that have sent out over 26,000 letters to 80 countries around the world. And the volunteers pay for all of the postage. So it would not happen if they weren't 
doing that. Um, one question I get asked and ask myself is like, why the hell would anyone spend time and money to like send a letter to a stranger? Um, so this is some feedback we got from a letter from uh, someone that had received a letter and then volunteered, and it felt like a pretty apt reason. Uh, the letters that crossed my path were touching, sweet, and sometimes humorous. They gave me a brief glimpse into the lives and thoughts of other people, people whom I've never met but on whose behalf I'm privileged to write. In a world where we move so rapidly from one thing to the next, this project in its unique simplicity has helped reconnect me with humanity. So I feel like a really nice encapsulation of, I think, why the project resonated with so many people. Um, the project now exists as a book, which is kind of a cool way of giving it tangible form. I also like that it went from digital to physical to then digital with the photos and then back to physical. Um, and I have that. I'm happy to share that later. Um, and this really taught me that it's all about human connection. Uh, I think that we all yearn to be known, validated, like seen, understood, right? Like we're humans, we're gonna die in that short amount of time that we have on planet Earth. I think we wanna connect with people. And to me, this project was a pretty big game changer. <clears throat> it also helped me create a couple of filters for the kinds of work that I wanna do moving forward. Um, one thing was really understanding the power of simple ideas. Not that simple ideas can't coexist with a big budget, but to me it's more important to have simple ideas than a big budget. Um, the value of real over perfect and just having, <clears throat> excuse me, work that feels authentic rather than uh, like overproduced. Work that's inclusive rather than moderated. Um, work that is done for a purpose rather than a profit. And I think that a lot of brands out there do have purposes. REI just did uh, a thing where they closed all their stores for Black Friday. I thought that was pretty powerful. And of course they care about their bottom line, but they're also willing to like take a stand. And ideally companies that do that, it'll affect their bottom line in a positive way, but they can still champion uh, a purpose. And then, uh, yeah, just the tension between like a creative's desire to be experimental and then uh, you know, the need to control that when you mix that with commerce, but I always try to push more on the experimental side of things. So one question I would pose to you guys and something I ask myself is, where do you want to see more human connection? And I'll actually give you guys, uh, why don't you partner up and just take 30 seconds thinking about, this can be uh, physical places, this can be a relationship, this can be on the internet, just where's anything that you'd want to see human connection with. I'll give you 30 seconds for that just to discuss. All right, if you can hear me, clap once. If you can hear me, clap twice. If you can hear me, clap three times. All right. You guys are like a bunch of school children. Um, <laughs> uh, I'd love to hear a couple of things that came up. You can just shout it out. Yeah. Commuting. Social media. Driving. Wow, that's three commuting. <laughs> School. The washroom. <laughs> cool. So I find this is a really good filter in creating projects, and it's something that I'll either intentionally or even just subconsciously think about when I'm considering new work. So I'm going to walk you through five personal projects that all kind of come from this way of thinking. Um, no one said airplanes, but to me that's something that is a great opportunity for human connection where like we're experiencing this miracle of traveling across space in a metal thing and everyone's miserable, right? Um, and so I was coming back from a wedding in Santa Fe, New Mexico and had just, you know, it was a very like warm, loving wedding. And then on the plane, everyone's like, ah. and I was like, ah. and I was just wondering, is there any room to, to play with that a little bit? And so I had this idea, what if everyone on the plane sang a song together? 
and <laughs> we'll sing Kumbaya together. And then I realized that was ridiculous, um, and no one would do it. But that same idea led to this notion of what I'm calling the Passenger Project, which is a survey that I've created that I'll hand out on planes and ask passengers to fill out a certain part of the survey and pass it on. So for this first one, it asks people to decorate one empty space based on the surrounding spaces and then pass to the person next to them. And so these are all different. Uh, each space is created by a different passenger. Um, so I like this one. It's going from San Francisco to Denver because someone put Go Giants and then someone else put Go Cards. And so there's almost a, there's a rivalry going on between them. Um, and I just kind of played with this medium, just experimenting. Mark an X where your home is and mark an X where your dream vacation would be. And so you can see I'm coming from Seattle. But it was neat to see how all over the place people's dream vacations were, including outer space. <laughs> so I'm a big believer that when you create constraint, it actually, this is true for me, uh, it can empower people to be even more creative. Like, I didn't anticipate that someone was going to put those X's there. Um, my hopelessly ambitious dream is to be a princess and live in a castle, <laughs> be, the two reason, be the reason two enemies become friends, teach a parrot to say, help, I've been turned into a parrot. So we've all got our ambitions. Um, this one asks people to, what does it say? Draw an item from your luggage in one of the empty suitcases. Someone drew a cat. Someone else drew a goldfish. I don't know if they were telling the truth or not. But um, anyway, that's just a fun little project I do. And you can go to thepassengerproject.com to download the PDF and do that when you're flying. If you're not local to Toronto, next time you fly, you can do it. Um, and this taught me that people are capable of a lot more than share, like, and tweet. I think that those measurements and also view counts can be really helpful as, like, metrics and benchmarks for success of a project and how it's shared and how it's used. But I also think that if we're only looking at those things, we're falling short to what, can, what, what the potential is. During the Occupy protests back in 2011, my friend Andy Dow and I were really interested in raising awareness about the wealth disparity, specifically in America. And to us, money felt like a really ripe canvas for this, right? It's something that we're constantly using. Um, it's circulating naturally. And it's like it doesn't cost us money to get more. Like, money doesn't cost money. Sorry, that just got heady. Anyway, uh, <laughs> we, we created a bunch of infographics based on facts about the wealth disparity and stamped them on dollar bills. Um, we had never used rubber stamps before. We didn't know about the laws behind stamping on money. <laughs> and at one point, if the wrong person had walked into his apartment, every surface that could hold, like every flat surface had a dollar bill on it. It was like everywhere. Um, but we just did it anyway. We were really excited about it and kind of just put our blinders on and, and made it happen. So um, this is the U.S. disparity of wealth, and it shows that the richest 400 Americans on the left have as much wealth as the bottom 150 million. And that's a true statistic. This one shows the average worker pay on the top left um, versus the average CEO pay, which is the entire bill. And we really liked the idea that yeah, as this money was spent, it would naturally move from one person to another, hopefully to someone that wasn't aware of this information. Um, so we also did the share of income growth in America, the U.S. distribution of wealth, and then a more tongue-in-cheek version, future property of the 1%. <laughs> um, we took this money to protests. We also stamped people's money. And we also made it so that people could use their home printer to not print money, but print on money. <laughs> um, and so it was really cool, and it was nice to get recognition from time. They say Occupy George gives the dollar bill a protest-friendly look. And the Victorian Albert Museum in London last year commissioned us to do a five-pound note on Queen Elizabeth. So that was a lot of fun. So at the top 0.1%, you can see that dot um, in both places has stayed the same. Uh, or sorry, the bottom 90%, the dots stay the same, but the top 0.1% has grown a crazy amount in the last uh, 36 years. 
So I'm really interested in the idea that everything is a medium. Um, a lot of people said commuting. That's a great medium to hack, and I it would invite you to think about what ways in which there are to um, bring more humanity into commuting, because that obviously is a need. I used to live near Alamo Square Park in San Francisco. It's a beautiful park. And I always thought it so I'd go there pretty often and always found it interesting when people were on their laptops or tablets or phones in the park. Um, not because I wasn't on my phone in the park, but because it felt like the antithesis to what parks were created for, which is like a break from modern, like, you know, we're not building skyscrapers on parks, we're preserving them for the natural world. Um, and as I saw this in more and more places, um, I walked past these no parking signs and thought, huh, it'd be kind of funny to do like a no technology zone sign. And so I worked with a manufacturer that made official signs and really tried to scope it out as close as possible to what these signs looked like. And then in the middle of the night, some friends and I installed these signs uh, at as many parks as possible across San Francisco. And so you can see here the final product. We really, really tried to be as, you know, as real as possible. The very bottom says San Francisco Parks and Recreation. Um, no cell phones, tablets, laptops, or smart devices permitted. Violators subject to $300 fine. And so this wasn't, uh, it wasn't coming from a place of like, bad, bad. It was more just like, hey, this is kind of silly, and isn't it ironic that we're using our phones in a park? Maybe we think, you know, a little more about our relationship with our with technology, um, and it was fun to watch people interact with it. Some people were confused. Um, other people immediately got the joke, and you can see this guy is taking a photo of a phone taking a photo. <laughs> and so many people like this shared it on Instagram, and within 24 hours, it got covered in the international news. And so this was in the Guardian. No tech zone sign in San Francisco befuddles residents. Alamo Square Park officials say they did not post sign. Hung a half block, hung a half block from where a Google bus picks up employees as locals wonder if it is an artistic protest. So, um, you know, and I'm aware of the irony that it got there through technology, right? Um, all the signs got taken down in, within a week or so, some within 24 hours. Um, one made it up on Craigslist. And so to me, the, the Occupy George project in this are great examples of, I, I guess I, I didn't mention it, but in the beginning of each of those projects, or maybe I underplayed it, like there was definitely a point where it was like, wait, are we really gonna do this? And what are the implications and the consequences? Um, you know, and I did a little research and I talked to a lawyer and it's certainly illegal in both cases. Um, <laughs> however, you know, it's not, it's not like we were, uh, removing a stop sign, which could like, you know, really be a bad. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I really push people to get a little bit out of their comfort zone and to fuck shit up a little bit and yeah, to take risks and break rules. And I think that, that that work really resonates with people. So we're all on our phones all the time, myself included, and I'm fascinated about what's going on behind our phones. Um, so there's like a person over there on their phone, and I'm wondering like, what are you, what are you doing? Are you taking notes? Are you taking photos? I'm just watching to see what other people are saying about your like, Yeah, cool. So she's on. <laughs> yeah, so she's she's checking it out. Um, so eventually, I got so curious about this that I would just ask people on the street like, what are you uh, texting about? <laughs> and uh, I did that, and then I asked people, what's the last photo on your phone? And actually, let's take a, a minute and just pair up again and just share with the person next to you what's the last photo on your phone and the backstory behind it.
All right, if you can hear me, clap once. If you can hear me, clap twice. If you can hear me, clap three times. Thank you. Can someone share something they learned about their partner with their partner's consent from that prompt? Yeah. Huh, not me, but interesting. Cool. Anyone else? That's pretty good. Cool. Maybe one more person? Yeah. Yeah. It was a proposal on the grass. Wow. So it was a proposal written on the grass. Cool. Was that someone here? Oh, no. I think it was like someone taking something that didn't have flowers to like a flower garden. Wow. Man, they're setting all of us, all, all of us else up for failure. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I'm just, it's endlessly interesting to find out, like, what are we doing on our phones? And so I've asked a lot of different people this. Uh, I started in San Francisco, and the film had such a positive reception, I ended up going to L.A. and doing this, just asking people the same question, what's the last photo, and then creating these little four- to five-minute vignettes of the most, uh, like, interesting results. Went to New York, Miami, Alabama, London, Detroit, and Chicago, and um, I don't have time to play those for you, but they're all available online at thelastphotoproject.com, and I'll just share a couple of results here. So this woman says, this morning I took a picture of my cat shit. <laughs> And you just can't make this up. The story was that she, w she and her friend were sending photos of cat shit back and forth to each other. Um, and responses really ran the gamut. Um, it's a picture of my husband's gravestone. He's been gone five years. And there were for sure a ton of instances where it was really, uh, you know, real stuff going on that people are holding. And to me, it's, it's really interesting that it can be as light as cat shit or as heavy as a spouse's... Uh, passing away and remembering them. Um, that is a strand I called, created called White Angel. It actually made me a little paranoid. <laughs> That's me chilling out of the spa with the cucumber water and all that shit. <laughs> and I, this guy was actually so interesting that I, I went back to New York a year after I'd shot that film and uh, made a little, like, day-long documentary about him. <laughs> he's he's ama amazing. If you Google Jassoon, J-A-Z-Z-S-O-O-N, really good guy. Um, so this has been watched, the whole series has been watched over a million times, and it's been cool to have it be picked up and, uh, you know, shared around and recognized, but mostly because it's... Uh, inspired filmmakers from around the world to reach out and uh, ask if I'd be comfortable with them creating last photo versions in their own respective cities, uh, to which the answer is always yes. And um, this is a little dated, actually. We have some new ones, but it's been cool in Slovenia, Brazil, Argentina, Germany, Korea, the Netherlands, um, France. People have done their own last photos, and so if anyone here is inspired to do it, by all means. Um, and you get an excuse to talk to strangers and find out weird shit about their lives. So, um, I believe everything is an experiment, and not only with creative projects, but just in life, I find that's a really helpful way of framing things so that there's ne never regret. It's just, oh, this is an experiment. It didn't work out. I'll try something else. It takes the pressure off of life a little bit. Um, don't tell my girlfriend that, but uh, that's a, a Tabor Kalman quote as well, who's a, a late designer. And the last medium I want to talk about is online. I know someone mentioned that earlier, social media. Um, I think that the Internet is a really incredible thing that exists. It's also confusing because it's limitless, and you can spend your whole life on the Internet. And so one thing I struggle with is, like, I can connect with a lot of people on the Internet, but it's hard to, like, have a deep connection with someone. So it's, like, breadth over depth. So I was working at Facebook as a contractor for a couple months right before they hit 1 billion users, and they wanted to do a project that would um, sort of 
celebrate the union of a billion people coming together on one network for the first time ever. And during this time, my creative partner, Jeff Greenspan, and I uh, came across an image of a Facebook friend of mine, this guy, Alan, and just really appreciated the humanity and the, I, I don't even know how to put words to it, but just seeing this image of Alan uh, evoked an emotion that was more profound than seeing a photo of him. And so from this idea, we came up with this project or concept called Selfless Portraits, which is strangers across the world drawing each other's Facebook profile photos. Um, we shared it with Facebook and they absolutely loved it. They were like, yes, we need to do this. The only problem is that we're a platform. We don't create content. We just let other people create content. Why don't you approach one of our uh, brand partners? And for sure, they'll want to do it. And so we talked to many big brands that partner with Facebook. They all, each one loved the idea, was really excited about it, but the same questions kept arising. What if people don't participate? We didn't really know what to say about that. We said, we think they'll participate, but we can't, there's no, we don't have a way of proving it to you. Uh, what if someone draws an inappropriate picture? For sure, there are gonna be some penis drawings out there, like no, no doubt about it. Um, but we really felt like the, the good would outweigh the negative. What if someone doesn't like their portrait? And this is a, I'm trying to think if I should go on this rant or not. Um, I, I <laughs> being politically correct is important and being sensitive is really important. I also think that there are ways in which being so sensitive to having anyone ever be upset that it stops a conversation from happening and it stops a dialogue or an exchange. And so in this case, none of the brands were actually ended up signing on to produce the project because it just felt like too much of a risk for them. Um, and to their point, there was also a lot of points of friction. We were asking people to hand draw these portraits and it just felt like a pretty big barrier to ask people to take time out of their day. So Jeff and I were so excited about this idea that we were just determined to make it and spent a year uh, self-producing it. We had no budget and partnered with a really amazing interactive company, Rally Interactive out of Utah. Um, found some, a person that helped produce a little bit, but it was, it was really, there was, we're talking no budget, maybe like a little, little bit that we were just pulling out from our own savings and then a year of really hard work uh, to develop this platform. So I did the UX design and this allowed people to choose a profile picture through Facebook. Then they received a stranger's portrait. Um, the only way yours would get drawn is if you drew a stranger. And then you'd submit your drawing. And so I wanna share a couple of those with you. <laughs> and it was cool to see the different mediums that people used, as well as uh, how much time some of these creations took. You might recognize this one. And so it's just been cool to see what, what people do. I just like thinking about this like really sweet looking woman on the left receiving the, the portrait. Um, this was drawn by someone in the Congo. <laughs> So this is a really cool example where we kind of got creatively hacked and someone realized that we were stitching together the original photo with the drawing. And so rather than doing a drawing, they just extended the background and put Tinkerbell with a drop shadow. But that was really cool. This was a really nice portrait to me because it really, to me it's a visceral connection where someone's like using their body to recognize and, and make a portrait of this person. So what would be the next step above this, a drawing on your body? So that's a tattoo artist's sketch. That's a tattoo. And uh, that's, that's Amarildo from Sao Paulo, Brazil on the left and Joey from California on the right. The two have never met, uh, all in the name of art. <laughs> um, so the project ran for 
just under three years, we just had to turn it into archive mode because Facebook updated their API, and we just didn't have the resources and bandwidth to kind of like reinvent it again. But in that time, over 50,000 portraits were drawn from 153 countries, and it was really rad to see how, uh, how people really did it, and they spent the time, and there were some really amazing portraits that got drawn. Um, and so that was no budget, no media buy, no moderation, and it really ended up being no problem. So to me, I know a lot of times if you work in companies or groups or really any capacity, that's everyone here, there are going to be people that tell you no. And I think it's important to listen to them and to you know, validate hearing them. I also think that if you're really passionate about something and you feel it on a gut level, like, no, this is like something that like, the world needs to see, I think there's a lot of merit in pushing forward and finding the way of making that happen, even if it's, you know, in our case, we didn't have the, the partnership that we were hoping for, and we just kind of made it anyway. And I really believe that people will enthusiastically jump past hurdles if offered a compelling human experience. So how does this translate to commercial projects? So um, I grew up lower middle class. My mom's a school teacher, public school teacher, and my dad's an artist. Um, so I need to also support myself and my art. Um, and I'm still figuring it out. That's a big part of what I'm doing is trying to figure out how can I take these projects and, you know, not compromise but still work with brands. Um, and I've had success in different ways and I've struggled in different ways. Um, I don't have time to go through too much of my client work, but one project I do want to share that felt like a really beautiful collaboration was with Airbnb at Sundance. Um, where they approached me and asked me to create an interactive installation at their Airbnb house. And their campaign was One Less Stranger, and so it was just connecting strangers. And so it felt like a really beautiful collaboration. And so I took uh, selfless portraits and reinterpreted it as strangers drawing strangers as a physical installation. So it would work in you coming in, we take your Polaroid photo, then put it in an envelope. You grab a stranger's envelope, and then drew the stranger, and then we'd have a gallery wall that um, displayed them. Yeah, it was really neat. It was a lot of fun. Uh, she says, I thought I was going to spend a few minutes, and I spent half an hour. It's a reminder that there's other people in the world who we don't know but can connect with so easily. I thought that portrait of him was pretty awesome. Um, heck yeah, this is going on my wall. So to me, that was a really uh, beautiful collaboration um, where it felt like the creative didn't have to compromise at all, and Airbnb was really happy as well. So in closing, one question I have for you guys is, what is one common objective across all creative briefs? And you're going to shout it out. Keep going. Let's just shout out a bunch. Participation. Communication. 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 Interact, participate. Interact, participate. Efficiency. Efficiency. I think it's with an E. So I'll, I'll, uh, the word I'm looking for is engage. And at least from, in my experience, I, I think all the, everything that you guys are saying is synonymous with engage. But at one point, I realized that all of the briefs that I was working on, whether it was as a consultant or as a director, um, they all had this word. And so to prove it to you, I scanned some of the more recent briefs that I've had. And sure enough, uh, across all of them, that word exists. Invent new ways of engagement. Engage them. Um, but what does it mean to engage? I looked it up, and it's to interact with, to hold the attention of, to induce to participate, to do or take part in something. And so to me, this is really like saying like to socialize, right? If you're interacting with someone, you're holding their attention, you're participating, you're taking part. And so that to me, that's just a really good reminder that even if a, a brief says one thing, at least the ones that I'm coming across are really all pointing to this thread of human connection and remembering like, oh, we're all like people. And so I'll leave that thought with you. So thank you for your time. Appreciate it.